Congressman Brad Sherman closed out the conference on Iran's nuclear program. He's chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Nonproliferation, and he spoke about proposed new sanctions on Iran. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't imagine a more fitting conclusion to our conference on countering the Iranian threat than our next speaker. Representative Brad Sherman has been a great friend to FDD over the years and a true leader in addressing the threat of a nuclear Iran. As a leading member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and chairman of its subcommittee on terrorism, nonproliferation, and trade, he has sought every opportunity to persuade the regime in Tehran to end its nuclear quest including his many significant contributions to the sanctions law passed in July. Representative Sherman has also served as an outspoken advocate for the people of Iran, supporting measures which are now part of the broader sanctions law to penalize Iranian human rights abusers by restricting their financial transactions and travels abroad. In October, Congressman Sherman introduced the Stop Iran's Nuclear Weapons Program Act, which would make it harder for U.S. corporations to conduct business with Iran through foreign subsidiaries, sanctioned entities that provide loans to the Iranian government and firms that prepay for future Iranian oil and gas deliveries, and reduce U.S. government contributions to international institutions that provide loans or other assistance to this regime in Iran. Congressman Sherman has already done much to tighten the screws on the Iranian regime, and I'm sure he won't stop until the centrifuges stop. We thank him for his ongoing work in the common defense of the United States and its allies, and we're deeply honored to welcome him here today. Thank you so much, Congressman Sherman. Hello, I'm Brad Sherman from California's best name city, Sherman Oaks. I'm pleased uh, to be with you. I see many of you have seen me speak uh, even in the 1990s. Uh, I wish that my remarks would be completely different from what you heard in the 1990s, but unfortunately uh, the, the most important change since then is that Iran has an awful lot more uh, enriched uh, uranium. Uh, I know that this is a conference that's gone on for a day and a half. My guess is that everything could, that could possibly be said has already been said, uh, but I haven't said it. <laughs> so I uh, think I'm supposed to entertain you until quarter after one. I'll try to leave some time for questions uh, and um, try to review where we stand with Iran's nuclear program and particularly the use of sanctions to try to end that program. Uh, with me here uh, are two members of my subcommittee staff. Where is Don McDonald? The brains of the operation. I chair the subcommittee on terrorism and nonproliferation. Don has been with me every step of the way for 14 years. And uh, this uh, uh, discussion shouldn't just be, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a quick half hour than what Sherman's up to. Please give your card to Don McDonald or to uh, CMAC uh, Kurdistani, uh, and uh, we'll keep in touch with you in the weeks and months to come. Now, the question I get asked most often is, can sanctions work? Uh, the answer is an obvious yes, if you're talking about the most extreme conceivable sanctions. For example, of what if we had absolute, total, extraterritorial, secondary sanctions starting on Iran today. Um, that is to say, we simply announce to the world that if any company in your country does any business with Iran at all, no company in your country can do business with the United States. Now, I haven't even proposed anything that extreme. It would clearly pose a uh, some risk to our foreign policy, some risk to the world economy, uh, it would create an image of the United States telling other countries what to do and putting the whole world economy at risk. But clearly, sanctions that prevented Iran from selling a single barrel of oil starting tomorrow or importing a replacement part for any elevator in Tehran uh, or any of the equipment throughout the country 
uh, would force Iran to choose between regime survival on the one hand and its nuclear program on the other. So the question isn't, can sanctions work? The question is, can we get sanctions that will work? That's a more difficult question by far, in part because our goal here is not to inconvenience Iran, punish Iran, demonstrate how much we really dislike Iran's policy. We're trying to get them to give up their nuclear program, their firstborn. They're not going to do it to avoid higher ATM fees. They will do it only if what is at stake is regime survival. So your question has to be, can the sanctions be so significant that it's going to cause the, uh, the Tehran government to fear that their survival of their regime is at issue? Now, our policy so far throughout the, the 90s and uh, the current decade ending is to do everything we can through the State Department to put sanctions on Iran to the full extent possible without angering anyone or offering anything. That is to say, we have a persuasion policy. Um, we will not do anything that angers uh, European governments or provide so much anger to European or Japanese-based companies that that anger percolates up to the highest levels of their government. We will not offer anything to, for example, Russia. I remember I was in Condoleezza Rice's office talking to her in early 2008, suggesting that we could get Russian cooperation on Iran if we were willing to tell them that that would affect our policy with regard to South Ossetia and Abkhazia and Transdinster Moldova. And uh, she looked at me like uh, I had arrived from another planet because talk like that was outside the scope of acceptable foreign policy discussion. Um, this was about six months later. Uh, you all heard of Abkhazia and South Ossetia because Russia accomplished on the ground through force uh, what it wanted to accomplish. And now a, a, a possible change in U.S. policy on that issue I don't think will entice Russia to make dramatic changes in its Iran policy. Uh, it is still possible, though, to offer Russia uh, uh, changes in our policy, major changes, changes outside uh, the pale, uh, in order to cure their uh, change. And as to China, we have not even thought of hinting to Beijing that even one shipload of tennis shoes might be delayed in a U.S. port for an hour if uh, China did not uh, change its policy toward Iran. Uh, you can imagine the corporate power that would be arrayed against uh, a, a policy of, uh, of, of hinting that to China. So we have continued consistently with a policy of doing everything we can through persuasion. But we're doing more now than we have uh, at any time in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. The reason for that is that we've become more persuasive. Now, is that because today's diplomats are smarter or more eloquent than those of the past? I know a few of them. I'd like to think so. But the main reason, the main credit for that has got to go to the Iranian regime uh, and those who have exposed its nuclear program, including the MEK. Uh, the world, is, it is much easier to persuade people that Iran is developing nuclear weapons and that that is a development worthy of their current attention in 2010 than it was to persuade countries of that in 2005 or the year 2000 or 1998. Um, we have to, however, if we're going to achieve our goal, go um, far beyond a mere persuasion policy. Uh, do sanctions work? They worked vis-a-vis -vis South Africa. A more apt example is Libya. Uh, we had the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act. We applied it against Libya. We did so because Europeans were willing to go along with us because of Lockerbie, an event that happened to occur on European territory. As a result, Gaddafi caved. He gave up a nuclear program that was less advanced than Iran, but more advanced than we thought he had. 
And we had to rename the act, the Iran Sanctions Act, rather than the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act. But up until very recently, from 1998 until a few months ago, we had a policy of never applying the Iran Sanctions Act to Iran. We applied ILSA, the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, to Libya until Gaddafi gave up his nuclear program. Now, I fear, I mean, I, I'll give you a, a, a little insight into what I think my life has been since uh, for the last uh, 14 years in Congress. I feel like I've been in the backseat of a car driven by the State Department. The car is headed toward Iran sanctions. I've been in that car since early 1998, and the car is going five miles an hour since 1998, and I'm shouting, go faster, go faster. Now it's approaching 2011, and the car is finally going 15 or 20 miles an hour. But having barely moved in the prior 12 years, 20 miles an hour will not get us to the destination on time. Now I have to persuade a driver that thinks the world has changed because we're going at 15 miles an hour instead of 5 miles an hour, that the pedal must hit the metal. And so far, I've not been successful. Now, the key then is convincing U.S. public opinion and world public opinion that uh, we need to do more. And that starts by explaining to the world what facts uh, that you already well know. And I'm going to waste a few minutes of your time explaining why Iran shouldn't have a nuclear weapon. Not because I need to persuade any of you, but because you need to persuade everybody else. And you've thought of five or ten ways to do that. And maybe one or two of my ways is different. And I want you to, be, uh, uh, to, to have all of your arguments and a few of my arguments. Because to the extent we have more sanctions now, it's because we've accomplished something in the last 10 years in convincing people, of course, uh, the Iranian uh, government has done much of that for us by continuing uh, its nuclear program. An Iranian nuclear bomb first means the end of the non-proliferation treaty and non-proliferation efforts worldwide. Because Iran does not have a hostile nuclear neighbor. It does not have a uh, dispute, uh, territorial or otherwise, with a nuclear neighbor the way Pakistan and India do. Um, it is a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty and has signed that it would not develop nuclear weapons. So how is it any different from Brazil or Egypt or Saudi Arabia, all of which are kind of mid-sized, mid-level countries, uh, Brazil at one end of that, perhaps uh, others at another end. How do you then uh, persuade any medium-sized country in the world that they should not keep up with Iran? Now, first, in the region itself, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the Gulf states, etc., are already moving toward a nuclear program uh, in anticipation that Iran will develop nuclear weapons. But in every region of the world, Having nuclear weapons up until now has meant there was something special about your country. You were either on the permanent, uh, you were one of the five countries that won World War II and were on the, the UN Security Council with a permanent veto, or you had a territorial dispute with another nuclear power, or it is rumored that Israel has nuclear weapons, and there are doubts that Israel has existential threats. Nobody is calling for the end of Brazil's existence. So Brazil, so, and no one's calling for the end of Iran's existence. So the non-proliferation regime crumbles. Second, you already have terrorism from Iran. Now imagine terrorism with impunity. Now, let's say, I don't suspect that, not, that the powers that be in Iran are going to wake up on a sudden, sudden day, a sunny day and everything's going fine. And they're going to dispatch all their nuclear weapons in an effort to bring back the return of the 12th Imam. Uh, I don't think Ahmadinejad would do that. His crazy father-in-law might, okay, but even Ahmadinejad wouldn't do that. But Iran has conflicts with the United States and others on every day uh, or every uh, month. A uh, U.S. destroyer in the Strait of Hormuz, an Iranian gunboat. Now, a, with a nuclear Iran... 
That is a confrontation between two hostile nuclear states. That's a Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, we had one Cuban Missile Crisis. We survived. But imagine a series of Cuban Missile Crises, whether it be confrontations in the Gulf or confrontations about acts of terrorism, a series of eyeball-to-eyeball of, 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 of -eyeball crises with a hostile nuclear state. And imagine the other side is considerably less sane than Khrushchev. How many of those are all going to turn out okay? And then, let's say, the Iranian regime is, faces a popular uprising, inshallah. Gorbachev faced an uprising, had nuclear weapons, shrugged his shoulders, walked off the world stage. I think this group instead would use their nuclear weapons, perhaps against Israel, to in a hope to regain popularity on the streets of Tehran, or against the United States, feeling that if they're going to go out, they might as well go out with a bang. I do not think they're going to shrug their shoulders, hand the keys to, a Demo to democratic forces in Iran, and uh, go off uh, on a book tour. Uh, now, a lot has been said about missile defense, and it's become a bit of a partisan issue. And I'm going to put aside whether missile defense works technologically and bring up one problem. Now, Iran is developing intermediate and even long-range missiles. And of course they would, because a nuclear-tipped missile is the Viag Viagra of tyrants. There is nothing cooler than being there at the parade and seeing the missiles go by and everybody knows that uh, they could be nuclear armed even if they aren't in the parade. That's, that's big time. That's what Khrushchev did. That's what America, you know. But uh, if there's serious thinking in Tehran, they will realize that develop, developing, the, uh, the, delivering the weapon by smuggling it is a much better option for two reasons. First, they get pinpoint accuracy without relying on technology. No North Korean technology, no Iranian technology it has more than a 90% assurance of getting within uh, a half a mile of where they want to hit. Second, uh, they get plausible deniability. Remember even Bin Laden denied and admitted and hinted uh, that he was behind uh, the events of 9-11. Um, now, we've strengthened our border to the point where people who otherwise would aspire to wash dishes in the United States feel it's not worth $1,500 to $3,000 to be smuggled into the United States. And if we do more at the border, we will discourage those, some of those economic uh, migrants. But a nuclear weapon is about the size of a person. They vary in size. You could smuggle one into this country inside a bale of marijuana, and uh, any you do not have to be a rocket scientist to smuggle across the United States. And just to give you how how uh, strong our uh, border patrol is, we have zero agents on the Canadian Alaskan border, so we, we devote zero resources uh, to say Anchorage. So um, it, it's we may improve our border. We may be able to create, make it a $10,000 or $20,000 project to sneak something the size of a person into the United States and to be sure that it, that it makes it and it's not intercepted. That will deter those who aspire to minimum wage or lower than minimum wage jobs. It will not affect those with nuclear weapons. Um, Iran. Um, I have strongly opposed any effort in the United States Congress to take the military option off the table. Um, I regard that as ambient for Ahmadinejad. It would help him sleep better. There are two reasons to leave it on, even if you don't think we would ultimately use it. One is to strengthen the argument of those in Iran who say we ought to give up our nuclear program because we may lose it for a variety of reasons, either to sanctions or to military action. Second, it provides an impetus for Europe to get serious on sanctions since those crazy Americans might do something, just might do something crazy, or Israel might do something that uh, uh, I'm sure uh, most uh, European governments would oppose. 
there hasn't been a lot of talk about how the military action would work most assume that whether it be u s or israeli there would be a week or two just hitting nuclear sites i don't think that that would prevent iran's nuclear program from going forward i think it would delay it for two or three years another approach that is not being talked about all that openly is what i call sanctions from the air that is to say a threat to everything every strategic asset in iran until it agrees to total inspection perhaps forced expatriation of some of their top scientists abandonment of facilities etc whether israel or the united states would well whether israel would have the capacity to sustain this over a period of time and what is whether israel chooses to do so i don't know but the assumption that military that air action over iran has got to be directed exclusively to nuclear sites fails to recognize that many of those sites are hidden could be hidden could be underground etc and that if iran feels free after a week or two to resume its program we may have delayed them by only a few years again i don't i don't think that either the united states or israel will use military action and i think there are a lot of problems with it not to say that i'm confident in sanctions it's always fun to have me as the last speaker because i'm really not an optimist on these subjects but clearly that is you know when we think of the military option we really have to think of two militants one aimed exclusively at the nuclear sites and i want to aimed at basically telling the iranian people and government that they will face constant strategic bombing of all valuable sites in accordance with with the rules of law the law of war until they be they get a award of participation from the iaea and more now in terms of sanctions the original idea was the iran libya sanctions act to prevent companies from making twenty million dollar more investment in the energy sector in iran this made a tremendous amount of sense in nineteen ninety six when it was adopted since iran at that time was not known to be moving toward a nuclear weapon certainly was nowhere close the goal was constant slow pressure on iran to get it to change punish iran for the activities that it engaged in in the nineteen nineties now and of course we didn't apply it had we done so we might be in a very difficult different circumstance but now preventing investments from being made in iran that will add to iran's economic viability ten or twenty years down the road is not going to get them to give up their nuclear program it's a part of it and there are going to be people in iran who argue if we can't get an investment and an improvement in this oil field in two thousand and eleven then in two thousand and fifteen revenues from that oil field are going to decline and that's bad and it hurts and it may mean one half of one percent of our gdp but if you're looking for fast action sanctions there are really two ways to look one is discussed at length refined petroleum the world is clamping down on refined petroleum iran has responded in part by using their petrochemical facilities turning them into gasoline refining facilities in part by getting some other entities to sell them refined petroleum if you had to pick one thing to do hitting refined petroleum makes sense but there are no silver bullets another way to go and it would be very difficult to arrange this even more difficult than anything we've had is to deal with replacement parts iran is not self-sufficient everything every major asset they've imported from abroad needs service and replacement parts the best example of how we haven't used this is that in two thousand and five the administration granted a special waiver 
to allow Boeing to sell replacement parts for its planes. The argument was made, well, we want those planes to be safe. I think what we should have done is announce that we want those planes grounded until the nuclear program is grounded, and we should have constantly repeated warnings, both for international and domestic flights, don't fly on any Boeing plane uh, operated by uh, the Iranian airline because it doesn't have replacement parts. Uh, that would adversely affect Boeing's ability to sell planes to other governments whose actions are perhaps half as bad as those of Iran. In any case, um, a decision was made. Uh, even up until now, Boeing is free to sell its uh, replacement parts, and of course Airbus is, go is as well. Whether it's an, an elevator in an office building, whether it's equipment for a refinery, whether it be a petrochemical refinery or gasoline refinery, uh, whether it's an airplane or a train, replacement parts are necessary um, and uh, easily available uh, to the Iranian uh, government. Now, um, I want to review where we stand as far as congressional enactments. Um, I've mentioned the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, now the Iran Sanctions Act. Uh, for a, in 1998, um, the Clinton administration uh, identified sanctionable actions and then waived any, uh, any penalty. But merely naming and shaming caused the Europeans to be very upset, and we haven't done it since. Up until last month, when we named and shamed a company owned by the Iranian government. Uh, needless to say, uh, that wasn't a tremendous act of courage. But what we have also done is we've persuaded major European firms to disengage from Iran. And we have told them they will not be sanctioned if they disengage and do not re-engage. And so increasingly, if Iran wants investment in its energy sector, it has to turn to China. There are three major Chinese companies. Uh, I've been, I expect that they are under investigation uh, by our State Department. And it will be interesting to see whether those companies are named and sanctioned. If not, then we will have pretty much adopted the policy of the last uh, uh, 13 years of, uh, say, well, what the State Department does, they don't say they're intentionally violating law. They say their copy of the Wall Street Journal announcing the particular investment was in the bushes and they never got it. So um, w it'll be interesting to see whether a one of the three major Chinese companies, uh, oil companies, is named uh, and shamed and then subject to sanctions. Now, um, I want to review SASADA, uh, uh, the uh, Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Investment Act. Uh, to go through its, has that already been done? Or, okay, you all know it, but I'll go, I'll go through it rather quickly. I know we have some C-SPAN uh, uh, viewers that may not watch the full uh, 20 hours of this conference. Um, this was became law in July of this year, should have been adopted um, certainly by 2002 when Iran's nuclear program uh, was announced. Um, and what does it do? First, it turns to foreign banks that facilitate Iran WMD transactions or terrorism or transactions with the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps and makes it, and makes it extremely difficult for them to do business with the, the United States. The key to the effectiveness is to identify what is the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps and its various agents and affiliates. Treasury has designated only 50 front companies. There are hundreds. Uh, we need to designate more. Uh, now, a, the key part of SASADA is uh, sanctions on uh, investments in the energy sector. The Iran Sanctions Act applied those to uh, 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 drilling operations. This adds them to those who uh, help Iran uh, refine petroleum. Uh, or who sell refined petroleum. 
uh, or who provide insurance, financing, or shipping of refined petroleum. Uh, at a very minimum, what this has done is it's forced Iran to stop being able to export petrochemicals, to use refineries that were not built for gasoline, uh, but were built for petrochemicals to refine gasoline. And uh, I'm told uh, that uh, uh, that will adversely affect uh, uh, engines uh, in, uh, in Iranian cars. Um, that's not the silver bullet or knockout blow, but it is uh, a, a, an effect. And uh, of course, Iran has, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, begun to reduce its subsidy uh, to uh, subsidized pricing on gasoline to Tehran motorists. Um, if uh, there's a whole list of sanctions that can be applied, some major, some minor, I would be very satisfied for a while. It would make my day if the State Department would apply even the most minor sanction to the most egregious violation. The best part of the bill deals with U.S. government contracts. And that's because it doesn't require affirmative action by any bureaucracy to enforce it. The way it works is if you want to get a U.S. government contract and bid on it, you, the executive of a company, must sign on behalf of not only your own company but all of its affiliated corporations that you are not engaging in sanctionable activity under uh, CISADA. Uh, the regulations have been uh, put forward uh, very recently and I look forward to uh, uh, executives selling uh, everything from soups to nuts to the US government reading this over and then calling all their affiliates and getting the message that you have to choose. Do you want to do business with Iran, where doing business is difficult, or do you want to share the U.S. government uh, business? Um, the other provisions include uh, uh, sanctions for those who export technology to the Iranian government that can be used to restrict the flow of unbiased information, a ban on imports. This is from Iran. Um, this has been something I've been working on since 1998. Uh, I remit, or 1999, uh, uh, Madeleine Albright allowed uh, Iranian imports into the United States. I went down to the floor and said, there's blood in the caviar. Uh, I hate to tell you, but now the Epicureans of this country will have to get by with Northern Caspian caviar. Um, a, a, and uh, it's hard to tell other countries not to do business with Iran when uh, you can't uh, even uh, stop the import of uh, uh, dried fruit and caviar. And an important part of the bill, it deals with divestment. Uh, it used to be that fiduciaries, particularly of state and local pension plans, but also uh, other private trusts were reluctant to divest from companies doing business with Iran in inappropriate ways uh, because they faced the risk of junk lawsuits saying a go local government can't have a foreign policy and or that they have a fiduciary duty to seek the highest possible return and somehow failing to invest in terrorism uh, uh, adversely affected that rate of return. We have uh, liberated them from that concern and a lot of us are working state by state, locality lo by locality. The law is very broad in how it's drawn and could probably be used in many cases to prevent companies from getting state and local contracts so it's not just we'll sell your stock, we may not buy your product uh, if you're engaged in these activities in Iran. Now, uh, that's as far as this law uh, goes. There are a lot of things that weren't in it. That's why I've uh, endure, uh, introduced the Stop Iran Nuclear Weapons Program Act, uh, and I'm pleased to say that uh, Senators Casey and Brown have introduced the same with, the, with a few changes act uh, in the United States Senate. Uh, clearly, we're not going to pass it this year, but it's the opening effort for next year. Uh, what does it do? First, it says whatever a U.S.-based company cannot do, they cannot do through their subsidiaries. Second, it, with regard to the uh, Iran uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps, it pushes the Treasury Department to designate a lot more front uh, organizations, and it prohibits any commercial transaction. You can't sell paper clips to the IRGC or its front groups. It sanctions those involved with the sale of uh, sovereign bonds 
uh, by the Iranian government or its entities, including its oil company. Now, this is important because the purpose of the Iran Sanctions Act was to prevent Iran from getting investment in its petroleum sector. Well, they can achieve the same thing by it, borrowing the money and hiring the technicians themselves. Well, let's prevent them uh, from either of those, especially borrowing the money. It sanctions those who pay in advance for Iranian oil, since that's a way of loaning money to the Iranian government, or who sign long-term contracts for Iranian oil, since that's a way of providing them with price stability. It denies tax benefits, chiefly uh, uh, faster amortization on exploration expenditures, to any corporation where any one of its subsidiaries has violated the uh, Iran Sanctions Act prohibition on investment in the energy sector of Iran. Now a controversial part that I haven't persuaded the senators to include in their bill, and that is it prohibits uh, the export of uh, aircraft parts to Iran for the reasons I've identified. Um, it uh, prohibits those who engage in sanctionable activity from getting, uh, uh, from participating in contracts with OPEC. We've achieved that administratively already. Uh, my subcommittee has jurisdiction on OPEC, and I'm pleased to see their board of directors has gone in the right direction. Also, Exim Bank, TDA, foreign aid programs, uh, and it requires the uh, the 401k of the federal government. We call it TSP from investing in firms that violate uh, the act. Uh, it prohibits uh, providing uh, mining and milling equipment to Iran if that could be used for mining uh, uranium. Um, it uh, allows states to impose uh, sanctions on insurance companies that would invest in Iran since insurance is regulated at the state level. It focuses our attention, and this again is only in the House bill, was unable to persuade the senators to uh, include this. Uh, and that is uh, to aim at the World Bank uh, and the IMF when they provide benefits to the Iranian government. There are still loans approved up until 2005, still disbursements in the pipeline where World Bank money is being lent on concessionary terms to the Iranian government. Uh, likewise, huge deal at the height of the uh, crisis, uh, the world economic crisis was an increase in special drawing rights of $250 billion uh, at the IMF, uh, basically underwritten by the U.S. taxpayer and others, a billion of those special drawing rights for hard currency vested in the Iranian government. We need to pressure these two institutions and even condition uh, our contributions to them to a change in their behavior toward Iran. Uh, got a provision some, that only a tax lawyer would love, and that is if you divest from a company engaging in the wrong kinds of activities in Iran, and reinvest that money in uh, a company that is pure, uh, you get a carryover basis and no capital gains tax. Um, no capital gains tax. Um, and uh, that pretty much summarizes the, uh, uh, the bill that we've introduced this year and that we will reintroduce next year. The bill we reintroduce next year will also include every good idea I can get from this room or anybody watching. The design of the bill is to be a complete list of every kind of sanction that we can impose, all with the goal of forcing the government in Iran to choose between its nuclear program on the one hand and its uh, survival on the other. Uh, I do want to point out, and I regret it, that any sanction to be effective will adversely affect the Iranian economy and the real people in Iran who are blameless. Uh, all I'll say is that, Nelson, we did the same on South Africa. We hit South Africa with significant sanctions. We hurt the economy. Most of that pain was felt by the blacks in South Africa. Nelson Mandela has thanked us for those sanctions. And I look forward to the day when a democratic Iranian leader, a leader of a country that complies with the Non-Proliferation Treaty, thanks us for the sanctions that we have imposed and that I would like to impose. Why don't I open it up for questions, although I haven't left quite enough time. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll keep going the questions. Who wants to begin? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, Stand up and do it. Thank you. Um, an issue that's been batted around here, like a cat playing with a mouse, mm -hmm. is helping the green movement. And 
the, that, that can happen two ways. It can happen directly by the government. It can happen by private individuals. But if private individuals are going to do this, uh, they or, or NGOs, they need a license from Treasury. Um, a license uh, has been applied for uh, a year ago. There's been zero response. No, 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 yes, no, nothing. Uh, so uh, part of your proposal as a legislation uh, might include a provision uh, mandating that Treasury uh, grant such licenses upon application within a deadline mm -hmm. unless it come, can come up with a rationale that it jeopardizes directly uh, the security of the United States, for instance, uh, secret technology. They can't just say willy-nilly, uh, we disagree, in effect. I've been pressuring the administration on this. We ought to do it by legislation as well. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, our prohibitions on exporting uh, certain uh, things to Iran uh, was never intended to make more difficult uh, communications efforts of Iranian distance. And then perhaps a congressional inquiry uh, of Treasury uh, of the pending requested license could be made pending the legislation oh. to see, see what can be done. Have done it, we'll, and, and, and we'll do it again. Thanks for reminding Thanks. me. Right over here. Huh? Uh, you've seen divestment uh, efforts on the state level, especially in California. You had uh, State Senator Joel Anderson, I believe, introduce legislation successfully divest our unions. Is there anything in the legislation that's addressing uh, uh, large publicly funded uh, uh, funds like the unions from divesting from Iran uh, and aiming at uh, removing not just our business with Iran, but also, you know, the money that's being floated around through like London funds and whatnot, find its way into the Iranian. London? Oh. The Asada bill already allows every fiduciary, public or private, to um, uh, divest um, and insulates them from a lawsuit. So if you were running a union trust fund or you were uh, running a uh, any kind of private uh, pension plan, and thought best to divest and were worried that you'd get a lawsuit from somebody saying, ah, you could have got a better rate of return if you invested in terrorism, um, you're now protected from that kind of lawsuit. So uh, we have facilitated divestiture not only by state and local governments, which faced an additional argument that because they were state and local governments, they couldn't uh, have their uh, take foreign policy issues into concern. Plus, every entity faced the fiduciary highest rate of return argument. We've taken both arguments uh, off the table. Now it's up to us to go union by union, company by company, city by city, and state by state. And I, uh, you mentioned my state. I'll especially uh, thank uh, Controller John Chung for his efforts on this. Uh, yeah. Yes, Aaron. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I'm a long, long-term fan of yours, and I remember when we worked together on the U.S.-Israel Energy Cooperation, Alternative Energy Cooperation Act, and talking about that, um, I'm just a little curious as to, in terms of buying oil from Iran, why the provision is just for um, people who are paying up front our long-term interest. Why can't we have a complete embargo of buying oil from Iran? Um, I began this discussion by painting the most extreme sanctions. If it were within my power to do so, I probably I might very well go in that direction. What we have to do, though, is see not only what can pass Congress, uh, but also uh, a part of that is what level of anger you face uh, from uh, Europeans and the world. Uh, the second thing is that as long as there's one country in the world, three or four kind of major countries in the world, willing to buy Iranian oil, they'll sell it pretty much for the world price. I guess if we could get them down to maybe only one or two buyers, that buyer would push them down on the price. But um, a, the, the bottom line answer to your question and so many others as to why something else isn't in the bill is, I'm not sure I can get this one passed. Do you have a follow-up on that? And then we're going to go right. We'll go right there. With, with this, it, it sounds to me, if, if I understood you correctly, uh, Congressman, that you sort of have a, 
a, a ladder of things you'd like to mm -hmm. to see this progress. I mean, first was getting sanctions a bill passed and signed, one that has real mm -hmm. teeth, one that closes loopholes. Second is enforcing, mm -hmm. the, the, because a sanctions bill without enforcement pretty soon falls apart, and then continuing to, I guess, turn the faucet more and more. Is that sort of the strategy? You're I'd realizing? turn the faucet. It's not like I'm all that incremental. I'd like to turn the faucet a whole lot right now. But uh, unfortunately, uh, there are 434 other members of the House of Representatives, not to mention the Senate, the President, all that other stuff. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to follow up with this. My impression is that you and your colleagues in, in, on, on the Hill are pretty much in accord. This was a remarkably bipartisan piece of legislation, the one that passed in, in July. But that, as you pointed out, the State Department, and in some cases the CIA, they're putting the brakes on the car, to use your metaphor. Well, look, we've been trying to pass new legislation. We passed some in 1996. We didn't pass any until 2010. That reflects mostly the lobbying of the foreign policy establishment headquartered in Foggy Bottom uh, and reflects mostly their ability to influence the Senate, where they have more influence than the House. So um, uh, we will continue to try to push uh, and... I, I guess I, I, I can thank this administration for letting us get what we were able to get. And uh, we couldn't get it before. And yet there were things that had they supported we would have gotten, right. and we've packaged them up into the next bill. I'm going to ask for three questions to be taken in order, and because they're all over time, and then you respond to those questions as okay. you wish in a, 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 a summary fashion. Dan Pollock from the Zionist Organization of America. I was at the hearings uh, just about a week ago where we talked about uh, the enforcement of the sanctions and mm -hmm. one of the things that you mentioned was that you had been unable to get the CIA to give you a classified briefing. I know nothing happens that quickly, it's just a week later, but in general, shouldn't Congress be able to get something like that from an executive branch office, really without question, and if we can't achieve that, uh, what chances there of getting real cooperation? Let's get a couple more questions, then you'll, uh, you'll, you'll answer them and, as you choose. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Sherman, uh, Ken Timmerman, um, I, I wanted to ask you on your, on your next legislation, uh, there, there are something like $8 billion of judgments uh, on behalf of victims of terrorism that involve uh, the Iranian government. They're unable to collect on those judgments. Um, the U.S. Treasury has not been very cooperative with the uh, families of the victims. It would be very helpful if there's something in your legislation that would require the Treasury and the Board of Governors of the Fed to cooperate and identify, for example, money that comes into the New York banking system in U-turn transactions where it can be seized. There's $2 billion that was seized in a Clearstream transaction, excuse me, that was frozen about two years ago in a Clearstream transaction uh, by chance. Uh, there's much more transiting the New York banking system every day. Uh, we could really put a crimp in Iran's support for terrorism by doing something like that. Support for terrorism by doing something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take one more back there. Who else was there? Go ahead, Claudia. Uh, it's not only in the UN system, it's not only the IMF and World Bank, there are also substantial programs in Iran uh, which involve U.S. money for everything from climate to development and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. Have you given any thought to uh, taking any measures against transfers for those? I learned as you respond to those questions, and perhaps so, because we're a little, I don't want to impose on your time, we're a little over in terms of our rental of this room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as to the first question, uh, there's an issue as to whether the MEK should be taken off the terrorist list. Over 100 members of the House have co sponsored a bill to force the State Department to do that. Many of us would prefer that the State Department make those decisions entity by entity rather than Congress legislating for a particular entity. On the other hand, a, the U.S. Court of Appeals has ruled the State Department hasn't done its job on determining whether the MEK should be taken off the list. And the MEK is clearly the most useful to the United States organization that is on the list. I'm not saying they're the greatest saint, I'm just saying they're the most useful of those who are on that list, a list that is supposed to include only sinners. Um, 
so what I asked for was a briefing from the State Department as to how it's going with their review as to whether to take MEK off the list. That would involve both the facts, what is the MEK done, and the law, how does the State Department apply that. They refused on the theory, well, the courts are looking at it, so we don't want to talk to Congress. That was pretty weak. On the other hand, uh, a CIA briefing was arranged for our State Department as to what the facts are. And so the legal analysis is not available, but uh, those of my colleagues who are interested know what the MEK did when they, and when they stopped doing it uh, and what the conjecture is as to what they might do again. And uh, I, again, hope very much that the State Department reaches the right conclusion expeditiously um, uh, rather than having to legislate item by item. Uh, but um, uh, at least the court thought that they had not done a very good job with regard to the MEK. Uh, as to um, uh, the U-turn uh, transactions and the judgments, I want to take a, a look at that uh, to see how much pressure it puts on the Iranian government and what my prospects are of, of getting it. Uh, there is, I have been supportive in general of those with judgments, and at the same time, those with judgments against those with legitimate claims against Iran exceed by far all the money we're ever going to get from Iran, and you want to make sure that uh, the pie is is cut. Uh, you, you want to take the you want to take the Iranian government's pie, but you want to make sure that the, the slices go in some proportion to to the claims. Um, and then uh, as to the UN, I want to take a look at what the UN is doing in Iran and shouldn't be. Um, will uh, uh, I face tremendous resistance with dealing with the World Bank and uh, and the IMF? Uh, I am the only person to have voted against the uh, huge IMF uh, package that was a you know in the, in the economic crisis simply because it would benefit uh, it benefit Iran. Um, so uh, I mean there were lots of issues on on that and there was a huge economic crisis, but for me that was critical. Um, are we done? I want to just uh, ask we give a round of applause, not just for this, but for all the service and all the hard work the Congressman is doing on this vital, vital issue. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. There are some of we've been passing out some questionnaires. You can suggest how we do a better job uh, next year, um, that we call on you more often for your questions. I assume we'll be part of it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Oh, that's a